If you get in a position where governments, uh, central banks start taking money and taking over some country's money, some sovereign country, and all of a sudden you can take my money that's in foreign reserves, or in Canada I can take your bank accounts. That starts happening, and it's happening right now. It's, I think a lot of countries are going to say, you know, I don't really want to put all my money in foreign exchange reserves because what if they don't like when they may take my money i think gold will will stand out as something they look at here at liberty and finance we're licensed brokers with miles franklin we are standing by the inventory ready to make sure you get what you need even into the wee hours of night and on weekends because preparedness doesn't stop call us 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And with us today, a new guest, Ted Oakley, founder of Oxbow Advisors. Ted, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Elijah. It's great to have you. And I wanted to have you on today because you've been talking for a while about that the stock market is in a bear market right now. And what we're seeing right now is really just par for the course. We're seeing a rebound in the stock market, but we're still in a bear market. Can you explain for our viewers why you see that we could be seeing a um, continued bear market from here, possibly even 50%? Well, you know, Elijah, one of the problems you have is that your extremes on everything and when I say extremes, I'm talking about a two standard deviation, three standard deviation event. And when you're looking at a two sigma event like that, where you have everything, I'm talking about price to book, price to sales, price to everything. And then on top of that, your margins for public companies just finished 21 at 13.4%. You and I have probably never see that, uh, more, more so you than me probably in our lifetime. But the problem with it is, all of these are extremes and they have, when they come back to the norm, okay, then you're going to have a problem. And I think on top of that, that in not just the stock market, but I think housing will really have some pressure on it in the next two or three years. And those two things together, I think will uh, cause people to get in a mode where they'll probably be doing more liquidating than acquiring, but we'll see, but I, that would be our opinion. And what is going to be the catalyst for this crash in both the stock market and the housing market? You know, what happens in bear markets typically is that you get in a situation where people can get an alternative return that's better. And I'll give you an example. If you had bought just the 90 day treasury or this year, you would have been better off than buying the S&P or the NASDAQ. And what happens in bear markets is that that's a continuum. It keeps on going. In other words, you you rally like we have the last 30 days, and then you go again. And I would guess after probably in May sometime or later, you'll start again on the downside. And what happens is you go to new lows and people get worn out a little bit. Then they buy it. It rallies again. It's a long, drawn-out affair. And we haven't gotten to a point yet where people are fearful. We don't see really any or much capitulation other than the bond market. We see a lot of people capitulating in the bond market, but not in the stock market. So that tells us that you probably have to go quite a bit lower before you see something uh, akin to a point where you think, hey, these are great buys. And so that's, that's what we would expect. Now, you've mentioned in other interviews before that really this currently, I mean, we're seeing kind of people buy the dip, right? What's happening right now in the stock market. But that mentality of buying the dip will just completely go away and people won't want to hold stocks anymore. Can you expand on this kind of mentality shift that you see coming? Well, I'll just give you one example. If you look at last year in 21, OK, that was the largest year ever for money that went into to equities ever. And it, it actually was larger than the prior 18 or 19 years combined, according to Bloomberg. So there was a lot of money went in. Now, if you look at all that money this year, it's all either even or underwater. None of it's making any money. What that tells us is, is that you get in a position where everybody owns the market higher than it currently is. As you go into selling, that picks up and they get into position where they're like, you know, I need to, I don't want to lose any more money. It goes on and on and on. They sell at the wrong time. 
That, but I think the catalyst for it usually is the market itself. It drifts off and they look at it and think, you know, I don't want to keep all that much uh, at risk right now. I think I'll take some off. And then sometimes you have an outside force. I mean, I was around in 87 and we just showed up one day. They had raised the rates. Greenspan decided he wanted to be another Paul Volcker. So he raised the rates too quickly. People shifted over into Treasury, sort of like they're doing now. Um, and then all of a sudden the markets were when you know, they went haywire on you. What are some of the assets that will protect against the coming crash? Well, the greatest thing really is cash. I mean, you, you, can, you can do a lot of things. You know, you can buy inverse relationships to the market and that sort of thing. I find sometimes that they're not always correlated one to one. That's been my problem with them, even though I will tell you in our equity accounts, we own a little bit of that because we're, we're really high liquidity right now. And we added that in as well. But what happens typically you want to own is cash. You could own, you know, we own the miners and we own gold as well. What happens though in a really deep sell-off, they'll they'll sell they'll sell that stuff down too. Not not as much, and it comes back really quickly. Uh, I could see you know the miners, you know, selling down with the market some, and we own them. Don't get me wrong, we like them, but uh, everything tends to come off and people get really scared but they're not really scared right now. In fact, they're not scared at all right now. So when that happens, I think you'll see most things come off. So you want to hold cash or you want to hold really short term, you know, 30 day to 60 day, maybe 90 day uh, treasuries or something. I think that's the best thing you can hold uh, to hedge yourself on the downside. It sounds like you're saying that that we'll kind of see a sell everything moment where even precious metals like gold and silver as well, that those will take a dip as well. Well, I'll just go back to 08, for example. Uh, you know, you, you, it didn't, they didn't stay there long, okay? But they corrected with the market. You know, oil did, gold did, the miners did, but they came back quicker than the market. And I would expect that was something that would happen now. And it would, it would not cause us, by the way, to sell out of this stuff. Uh, we really like the miners. We've owned them for, you know, three or four years. And so that's a position we really like. And we own, we own the bullion too. We're not going to come out of that because we're not sort of quick enough to be able to decide how, you know, when to go back in. But we, because it's something we want to own the next five years. But, but I suspect that what you'll see is, and I've, I've seen this before, they drag along. But when you get toward the ends of these things, the bear markets, then people really start capitulating. You know, in 2000, I'll give an example. Uh, you know, the markets were in the bear market. You know, the peak was March of 2000. And the market sort of drifted off. They drifted down in the summer a bit. It came off, you know, the first time quite a bit. And then they rallied back up. They weren't down that much for the year, maybe 10%. But, but that basically set the tone for what the next three years were going to be. And I think this year it's the same. I think we set the tone here in the first quarter. And we'll see if it you know, plays out that way. But I think we've got a good chance of that happening, Elijah. So it seems like your perspective is, I have a good amount of cash right now because we're going to see buying opportunities soon in the future. I don't know how soon, Elijah, but I do think you'll have opportunities to do a lot better than you can do now. You know, and then in a lot of areas, I think private business is overpriced. Real estate, residential real estate, it's very overpriced. I can see, you know, 35 percent declines in that marketplace. Uh, and the reason is it just it, all of that stuff has just gotten so far out of line that people you know, they're sort of blind to what can happen. But I'm, I don't know how soon it'll happen. I'm just saying that what happens is it hasn't hurt you. For example, I've told people this. It has not hurt you this year to own cash. In fact, it's helped you. So uh, this idea that, you know, I, I don't want to own cash. Well, it's not working in 2022. Uh, cash has been pretty good. So um, we'll see how it plays out. But that's what my thought process would be. I think a lot of people right now, the reason they don't want to hold cash is because they're afraid of inflation, you know, at 8.5% right now. Do you see inflation continuing to be high or cooling off soon? Well, I think by the time you get to the fourth quarter this year, we'll, we'll, we'll still have inflation, but disinflation. In other words, instead of what they're calling 9%, maybe 4% or 35 or something, some number, I mean, you'll still have something. But I, you know, I have people tell me that before too. I worry about inflation, so that's why I want to own hold cash. And so my answer to that is, well, would you rather own cash at a one and a half percent return, or have a negative return still against inflation 
in the stock market right now. <laughs> I mean, it, to me, that's a double whammy because my stocks go down and it inflates because at least I can sort of a little bit hold my own, you know, if I've got some liquidity. Now, when it comes to what is traditionally seen as safe havens, as we talked about before, gold and other precious metals, I know you are for the long term bullish on gold and have a price target of about $5,000. What makes you so bullish on the precious metals longer term? Well, I, I think longer term, what's going to happen is, and you can see this now, and particularly, by the way, with what just happened with Russia on, on foreign exchange reserves. And you saw it in Canada as well. If, if you get in a position where governments, uh, central banks start really um, taking money and taking over some country's money, some sovereign country, and all of a sudden you can take my money that's in foreign reserves or in Canada, I can take your bank accounts. That starts happening and it's happening right now. It's, I think a lot of countries are going to say, you know, I don't really want to put all my money in foreign exchange reserves, because what if they don't like them? They may take my money. And so I think you'll see a lot of those smaller countries in different situations with people even, where they'll say, you know, I want something different. Do they go to some sort of, um, uh, you know, decentralized finance in terms of one of the cryptos? They could, I suppose, but I think gold will, will stand out as something they look at. And you have mentioned that, that really gold is going to be seen as more of a safe haven. That's what people will run to. They will not, for the most part, run to, as you've mentioned, the 9,000 uh, cryptocurrencies that are out there. So why is that your view? Because I know a lot of people do believe that cryptocurrencies have emerged as kind of an alternative safe haven. Well, I think, Elijah, there's two, four ties, two sides to that. I think on the crypto side, where you want to get to on the crypto side is some sort of decentralized finance, not so much crypto particularly, but uh, if I'm, say I'm a, a, a migrant worker from Mexico and I want to send $500 back to Mexico or Spain or overseas, what happens is now it costs so much money for somebody to do that. If you could do some sort of decentralized finance, you had some sort of stable coin or something like that, that's different from all the cryptocurrencies. You've got 9,500, 9, whatever cryptos out there, my guess is that most of those, most of them, will lose it. My guess is. I don't know any other way out because the only way to make money on those is to have somebody else pay you more money for them. And right now they're all down in price. And secondly, I think I, I think what happens is I think more people will come to know that, hey, you know what? Uh, if I don't have a computer or I don't have a phone or I don't have any electricity, for example, and I, but I've got some gold in my pocket, <laughs> I could still make things work. Uh, I think there'll be some of that that goes along. I can't remember if it was Charlie Munger or whoever that said, hey, I want to own something I can drop on my foot. And uh, maybe there's something to that. But I, I certainly see that as something that'll be on people's minds to where they particularly if you look at the NFT market right now, it's crashing. It's coming apart. And what you're going to find is all this extra money that blew up the cryptos and the NFTs, you know, they were Pokemon games. I really think they were. And I think that's how it all came about. And uh, part of it's going to work, though. I, real, I will say that. But a lot of it are just young people, unfortunately, I think, that got caught up in it. And I think there'll be a lot of losses in it, which there already are. I think that's a very good point there is, you know, how can we even pick the right one, right? If 99% of them are going to be be falling, it's it's better to hold something real in your hand that, you know, you can trust and that's been that has been wealth for for many thousands of years. But Ted, before we let you go, are there any last thoughts you'd like to leave with our viewers and where can our viewers find you online? Well, the place to reach us is really at oxbowadvisors.com and when you get there, it will we have a, a lot of books, a lot of things we have on that site that I think you would find interesting. A lot of great interviews uh, uh, that we, we've, we've done with people you thought were really insightful as well. But I think the biggest thing for me right now to leave with people is don't underestimate right now safety. I know you haven't had to be safe the last 12 years. Obviously, everything's worked out fine. The sell-offs were real short term. You didn't have to worry about it. I do not think that's where you are right now. I think you're in a situation where there's a lot of precarious situations, real estate, private business, and stocks and bonds. You know, all of that stuff 
is at, at nosebleed levels, really. And it would pay you probably to step back and don't worry about it. You, you know, you, you can live, you need to play another day. You need to survive to play another day. And that would be my advice. All right, Ted Oakley from Oxbow Advisors. Thank you so much for your time today and God bless. You bet, Elijah, thanks. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.